and good morning here at St. Elizabeth's. And I wanted to tell you, we, we did this scripture study last week on Facebook Live. However, the connectivity issues were such that it was a garbled up mess. So I'm going to go ahead and record this in another format for posterity on the YouTube channel. This will be the 29th Sunday of Ordinary Time, Year A, so the readings will be from Isaiah, from St. Paul to the Thessalonians, and the Gospel of Matthew. Let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Again, uh, we're re-recording this due to some connectivity issues. The first reading is from Isaiah in chapter 45, and we will see here is the naming of a King Cyrus the Great. Uh, this is an artist rendition of Cyrus and the people of the world approaching him, uh, either for mercy or wisdom. So just as an introduction to the book of Isaiah, he was a prophet to Judah, which means to the southern kingdom where Jerusalem, the capital, was located. He was around 742 B.C. when he lived. Uh, he as all prophets did, condemned royalty and priests for their sinful activity, for going against God's will and even worshiping other gods. He was concerned for the poor and the widows and pronounced condemnation of Judah. By the time we get to chapter 45, we are looking at uh, the pronouncement that someone will come to free the Jews and this is written 150 years before Cyrus the Great of Persia actually enters the world stage. So this is truly a prophetic portion of Isaiah. So I'll start reading. Thus says the Lord to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I grasp, subduing nations before him and making kings run in his service opening doors before him and leaving gates unbarred. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen one, I have called your name, giving you a title, though you knew not me. I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. It is I who arm you, though you know me not, so that toward the rising and the setting of the sun, people may know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, there is no other. So who was this Cyrus? Uh, he's called Cyrus the Great. He had a bunch of titles, the Great King, the King of Kings, the King of Anshan, Media, Babylon, Sumer and Akkad, King of the Four Corners of the World. So as in ancient history, we see several empires conquering the world. The Persian Empire was one such empire, and they had their time conquering the world. Just a, a map quickly showing the territory of the Achaemenid Empire, which was the family, I guess, of Cyrus the Great, and the Persian Achaemenid Empire, as you see, was around 550 to 559 to 530 BC, and that part in the purple are all the lands conquered by the Persians and Cyrus the Great. If you look on there to the left, you'll see the Egyptian Empire, to the northwest, the Grecian or Macedonian Empire, um, just all of the, the lands traditionally known in the Middle East and even parts of Asia were conquered by Cyrus the Great, Babylonians, the Assyrians, and all the others around there. So who was Cyrus? He was actually a good king, and people welcomed him conquering them. So maybe not the king of the other land, but certainly the people would welcome Cyrus entering their land after conquering. He often kept the king around as a counselor or a, a leader in the area. 
that was one way to maintain the peace and one way to have someone with familiarity of the region to help efficiently run the region. A way to keep the peace is sometimes he married one of the king's daughters to inherit the kingdom later. It was more of a peaceful transition than warring. He allowed other religions to worship and uh, allowed slaves and captives to leave. So it, for our purposes in this reading and in the history of God's chosen people, that's a key part in the fact that he allowed slaves and captives to leave, including the Jewish people that were slaves and captives in Babylon. So when the Persian Empire conquered the Babylonian Empire, Cyrus the Great allowed the Jewish people to leave. Just some other facts. Uh, Xerxes uh, is a king four, four kings later than Cyrus the Great. He's likely the king mentioned in the book of Esther. If you read that book, uh, there's a different name for the king, but the time frame is precisely the same. So it may have just been the Jewish word for Xerxes. And so Xerxes is also known to have attacked Greece and the Greek Empire, trying to finalize conquering the Greek Empire. Uh, he was ultimately unsuccessful, and that spelled the end of expansion of the Persian Empire and the beginning of the uh, Greek Empire. And I guess one other thing to point out on here is that God uses people and countries despite the fact that they may or may not know him or like him he will choose who he wants to do his will and in one way cyrus the great was fulfilling the will of god and fulfilling the prophecy of his people being freed and let go despite the fact that xerxes was a pagan and did not know god at the time i'm sorry that cyrus the great did not know God at the time, he was used by God to free the chosen people. Later on, we'll see Alexander the Great of the Greek Empire also be used by God in a way. When the Greek Empire conquered the world, the known world, they also brought the culture, the language, and just the ethos of the Greek Empire with them. And therefore, all of the communication was in a common language to the whole known world. And so God used Alexander the Great in one way to promote that communication line where Paul could write a letter and it could be read by the entire known world. And so the spread of Christianity was allowed to move a lot quicker with that common culture and common language. So Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, if we see, it is in that Macedonian and Greek area. Uh, there's a couple of other places that are familiar to letters of Paul, the Corinthians, the Ephesians on the southern part, the Philippians immediately to the north, and we see the town of Berea or Berea to the west of Thessalonia. So an interesting story is that Paul visited Thessalonia, Thessalonica for a brief period of time, but was forced out rather quickly and fled to Berea. And it is there where we see the reading that the Bereans believed in what Paul had said because they checked it with scripture. So you see both the value of the scripture, which would have been the Old Testament at this time, and the spoken word or tradition of Paul. And just an interesting aside there that, that this letter is written, and it's one of the first letters, but it's written to Thessalonica because he was kicked out of there after a very brief period. So it's a city in Macedonia. He was a trading hub between Asia and Europe. It's actually the story of him getting kicked out is in Acts 17. And as I mentioned, it is one of the earliest documents we have from the New Testament around 50 AD that we can judge when it was written. So the reading goes, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians 
in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, remembering you in our prayers, unceasingly calling to mind your work of faith and labor of love and endurance and hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before our God and Father, knowing, brothers and sisters, loved by God, how you were chosen. For our gospel did not come to you in word alone, but also in the power and in the Holy Spirit and with much conviction. Okay, so I'm kind of, uh, like I said, re redoing this, and I'll have to just recall my questions and uh, talking points. Grace to you and peace. So the entrance of the thought of grace that it is freely given to us without any effort on our part or any work that we could do on our part. So that grace to you comes from the Holy Spirit. Uh, although not mentioned in the opening of this uh, reading, it is the Holy Spirit that gives us that grace and the peace. So that peace comes with that grace and our acceptance of it. The work of faith. So we see that the theological virtues being displayed in this in this opening of the letter of Thessalonians. Work of faith, labor of love, endurance of hope. So we see there that that faith is not something that is a one time activity and then done. It's not one and done. Faith takes work. It's in, in, as also love is a labor. It is not an infatuation. It is not something that we like and just immediately have, uh, you know, like when we are married to our spouse, that there's no effort involved at all for the rest of the uh, marriage. Of course not. Uh, just like there is work involved with faith and belief there's also work with love. Love in itself is doing something for the other uh, and not for yourself. So that in itself, due to our, our selfish desires, is a labor. It is hard to do. The endurance of hope. We see there that, you know, we hope in the coming of Christ. We hope in the salvation of all souls. So the, uh, and we hope to be a part of the salvation of our families. We work, we work for that salvation. Um, but hope also takes endurance, especially in trying times, in times of persecution, in times of natural disaster. All of those times create a need to endure, a need to work, a need for labor, for faith hope and love. The gospel did not come in word alone in the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we see in the very first part of the opening of the letter, we see God the Father and God the Son mentioned, and then we see the word, it was not coming in word alone, it was with the Holy Spirit. So that Trinitarian aspect of our religion is brought forth in this very first document that we know was written. Uh, we're already acknowledging the Trinitarian nature of God. Three persons, one nature. Um, with, much, much, well, with much conviction. Again, um, there is that desire and that conviction to spread God's word. It's, it's also a work and a labor and things we have to endure sometimes. The gospel, render unto Caesar. So as you can see here, here's a coin from the time, roughly around the time of Christ. Uh, it says Caesar Augustus. The very first part was the DIV. So there were Caesars immediately prior to Christ's time, Caesar Augustus and I believe Julius Caesar, that that thought of themselves as divine, and they were declared divine. And so when they were coining these denarius or other coins, they put the divine Caesar Augustus. Just an interesting tidbit there. So as we went through the Gospel of Matthew, 
We've had the parable of the wicked tenants. The chief priests and Pharisees attempt to arrest Jesus after that parable. We have the parable of the lavish feast. And then we hear the story today of Caesar's coin question. And immediately after that in the Gospel of Matthew, we'll see the seven husbands question where they attempt to trip uh, Jesus up today in today's reading with a secular versus uh, religious question. The next portion, we, they are asking him a question about the afterlife in order to divide him amongst the Jewish people and their conceptions of the afterlife. So all of this is, again, occurring around that time of the entrance into Jerusalem and the Holy Week and different groups are trying to entrap and ensnare Jesus into being arrested. The reading goes, the Pharisees went off and plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are a truthful man and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you're not concerned with anyone's opinion, for you do not regard a person's status. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Knowing their malice, Jesus said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that pays the census tax. They handed him the Roman coin. He said to them, whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. At that, he said to them, then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. When they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. So a few points I'll have to <laughs> refresh my memory on. So what group tried to entrap him? There's actually two groups. We had the uh, Pharisees who were um, a, a portion of the Jewish faith at the time and they had the Herodians. And so the Herodians were those that were uh, permissive or on the side of the Roman occupation. Whereas the Pharisees were very much against Roman occupation, they were not uh, on the side and did not usually uh, team up with the Herodian sect that, that believed that the Roman occupation was good. So therefore, we can kind of see the animosity that Jesus brings uh, to Jerusalem in that groups that normally would not even talk to one another are in this case trying to team up to entrap him. So we see here a very religious group, the Pharisees, uh, on one side of the question, and we see a very secular, the Herodians, those that are pro-Roman Empire, on the other side. So this entrap him in speech. By having the Pharisees on the religious side and the Herodians on the other side, we see that there could be no good answer if they were, if Jesus were to choose one or the other. Uh, teacher and truthful man. So in one way, those uh, signs of how they address Jesus are in, in, in one way respectful, but coming from the Pharisees or actually the Pharisees uh, disciples or followers, since apparently the Pharisees were not willing to go themselves and sent others with to, to do this uh, bidding. But teacher and truthful man may at the surface appear to be some type of uh, respectful address if in fact they, they knew at this time that Jesus claimed to be the son of, a son of man, the son of God, the incarnation, Jesus Christ. So these kind of titles were more of a, more of a jab or an insult uh, as a preface to the question. So the, is it lawful? Um, again, the question was, is it lawful to pay 
the Roman tax. Again, when you have the Pharisees on the religious side and the Herodians on the Roman side, it makes it very difficult to answer that question without making someone mad. Uh, he knew their malice. So that's an indication of the divine nature of God uh, that, that he would know and, and knew that both sides had it out for him and he was going to have to address that uh, in order to fulfill his time. And uh, his question was whose image was on that. And knowing that, that there were several emperors in succession, we don't know exactly whose image on there was on there. It could have been Augustus. It could have been Tiberius, who was there at the time. But it was a Roman emperor, the Caesar, the king of, of the Roman Empire. So the question he asked is what belongs to Caesar and what or give what is Caesar's to Caesar and what belongs to God to God. It was an interesting question because that coin bared his image and therefore the conclusion was that that should go to him. However, ultimately everything comes from God. God created the universe. He created everything out of nothing. So in one sense, it all belongs to God. But in the fallen world we're in, there is a need to provide for the common good through the government, and that's what the, the belonging to Caesar part is. Everyone uh, has some responsibility um, whether that responsibility plays forth in the government or individuals, uh, that's, that's a good question and a, a lengthy discussion to occur. But in the time of Christ, there was the need for defending the empire from aggressive barbarians in this, in the, around the uh, empire. And despite whatever abuses may have been done with regards to collecting additional taxes than that was prescribed. Uh, that was deemed an acceptable uh, thing that, that needed to be done in the empire was paying some amount of tax. And so that's the basis of the, of the belonging to Caesar. Not necessarily from a broader perspective because everything belongs to God. So that concludes our discussion and uh, scripture study for the 29th Sunday. Let's close with the St. Michael, the Archangel prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So thank you for listening. Uh, again, we will have in-person scripture studies going forward after the 9 a.m. Mass and concluding before the 11 a.m. Mass. Thank you for listening.